Okay, so today we are going to be looking at the work of John Stuart Mill. And in particular, we're going to be looking at his essay on liberty, where he makes the case for freedom of speech and the right to, um, to voice your opinions on a public platform and how, why that is vital for a democracy. We will explore the idea of the tyranny of the majority and we will explore the idea of the harm principle. All right, so many of the arguments that you are making in defense of freedom of speech are actually arguments that were uh, coined by and written by and presented by this man here, John Stuart Mill, um, uh, who lived from 1806 to 1873, as you can see. And his idea was that um, there ought to be limits on the power exercised by society over the individual. Now remember, he's not just talking about the state here. In the instance that I showed you, uh, where you know you had DG Parks come in and say, ye karo, wo na karo. Peto, there was a figure of authority, a figure that belonged to the state. But John Stuart Mill believes something even much more fundamental than that, much broader than that. He believes that even your own friends and fellow countrymen don't have the right. Society does not have certain rights of the individual. You recall from Rousseau, which we did last week, uh, that uh, Rousseau said, you know, we must talk about the general will, and once the general will has been established, even those who didn't necessarily agree with the general will have to now comply with it. Not so much so with John Stuart Mill. He says, liberty limits to the power which the ruler should be permitted to exercise over the community. So liberty, you know, uh, we, we have already spoken about what he calls political liberties or rights that limit the power of the sovereign. We've spoken about constitutional checks, such as obtaining the consent of the community. All of these things have been established already by the French Revolution. The idea that the government ought to be the, uh, created, the state ought to be created by consent, and that the, there should be limits placed on the power of the sovereign against the citizen. He has to obey the law. So, for example, the French Revolution has already established the idea of majority rule. Magistrates of the state should be their delegates, revocable at their pleasure. In other words, the state ke log hain, wo awam ke chune ve log hain, aur awam jo hai, uske paas ye haq hai, ke agar wo chahe, to unko authority de, agar wo chahe, to unse wo authority chain le. They must be elected and temporary rulers. Um, uh, this became the prominent object of the exertions of the popular party. So all rulers must be elected. There can be no unelected people. Or ye nahi ki sari zindagi ke liye bas ab wo bacha ban gaye. In fact, they are temporary. In other words, every five years we, or four years, we get to redecide whether we want these rulers or not. Rulers should be identified with the people, their interests, and um, their will, and should be the interests and will of the nation. The nation did not need to be protected against its own will. There was no fear of its tyrannizing over itself. So rulers were to represent the will of the people, the will of the nation. And uh, the, the individual at that time, it was not thought because Uswaka to a minority, a feudal minority, a aristocracy, they were ruled by the people. So now the French Revolution has established that okay, it has to be the majority that will rule. Um, hence, the, the whole question was that there was a minority that was in power, whereas the majority was out of power. So the whole question now became how to bring the majority into power. But once the majority is in power, the questions now begin to change, he says. Now we have a new danger to liberty, and that danger it doesn't come from the minority, it in fact comes from the majority. And this he called the tyranny of the majority. The people may desire to oppress a part of their number, and precautions are as much needed against this as against any other abuse of power. So we are, for John Stuart Mill, the problem now is not only that the state may abuse its power, but that people may, the majority may abuse the power uh, against a, a minority. The tyranny of the majority, he says, is in fact more formidable because it leaves fewer means of escape, penetrating much more deeply into the details of life and enslaving the soul itself. The tyranny of the state has put limits against it, but it's not so big a problem because when the state comes to the figure, he will be able to identify himself. He will say, I am D.G. Parks, 
I am SHO, I am IG police, I am Flana, I am Dhamkana, etc. More often than not, they are required also to wear uh, a uniform that, from which we are able to identify that they are officials of the state, especially if they are in law enforcement. <laughs> Um, even when they are, do not wear a uniform, they are required to, to present their identity to whomever they are challenging at that particular point in time. So they are easily identifiable, and they are not that many in number. The number of state officials in Pakistan numbers, you know, in the hundreds of thousands, etc. So you can easily see, ke, oh, yaar, wo authority figure aara hai, ezit roh zara bach ke chaliye, chaliye, thik hai na? Magar, what happens when the person sitting next to you uh, is the person that's going to be checking you, is the person that's going to be judging you, is the person that's going to be looking over your shoulder to make sure that you're doing w what the right thing is. That can be much more, he says, difficult. It can be much more tyrannizing because there is no means of escape. Everybody around you is now the person that's going to be checking you, that's going to be looking into your actions and even looking into your thoughts. This is very dangerous. What is this? What, are we, what is he referring to? He is talking about the tyranny of the prevailing opinion. By prevailing, we, means, we mean, of course, the dominant opinion. And he says, there needs protection also against the tyranny of the prevailing opinion and feeling against the tendency of society to impose by other means than civil penalties its own ideas and practices as rules of conduct on those who descend from them. Society bhi ek aap pe ek musalsal kadi nazar rakhi hui hai aur aap ke upar ek danda leke bethi hui hai ke ye opinion drust hai, ye opinion drust nahi hai, ye opinion rakhna jayez hai, is opinion ko rakhna na jayez, na jayez hai to fetter the development and if possible prevent the formation of any individuality not in harmony with its ways and compels all characters to fashion themselves upon the model of its own. Sub individuals pe pressure hai ki society ka jo stereotype hai ya rather the dominant uh, uh, opinion hai uske saath aap bhi conform karein. There is a limit to the legitimate interference of collective opinion with individual independence. Koi iski had honi chahiye, mukarar karni chahiye. And to find that limit and to maintain it against encroachment is as indispensable to a good condition of human affairs as protection against political despotism. Yani ke riyasat jab aapke haqoq salab karti hai to uske khilaaf to hume हम अवेयर हैं और हम उसके खिलाफ अपने आप को मनज़म भी कर लेते हैं अब ये वीडियो और इस किस्म के और वीडियोस जो हैं वो वायरल हो चुके हैं क्यों क्योंकि रियासत जो है वो किसी एक आर्टिस्ट के काम को जो है रोकने की कोशिश कर रही है और सोसाइटी जनरली वही ओपिनियन रख रही है जो आपका भी ओपिनियन है कि ये ऐसे नहीं करना चाहिए चाहे वो गलत भी है बुरी आर्ट भी है जो भी है उसको एक्सप्रेशन करने का हक होना चाहिए तो ये एक प्रिवेलिंग ओपिनियन मेरा ख्याल है कायम हो चुका है अगरचे रियासत के लोग शायद इसको कबूल ना करें मगर सोसाइटी बाय एंड लार्ज इसको कबूल कर चुकी है मगर जॉन स्टूअर्ट मिल इज टॉकिंग अबाउट समथिंग मच मोर फंडामेंटल देन दैट ही इज नॉट टॉकिंग अबाउट द स्टेट कमिंग एंड क्रशिंग योर राइट ही इज टॉकिंग अबाउट योर फेलो मैन कमिंग एंड क्रशिंग योर राइट वट इज ही मीन वेल for, he wants to identify for you certain ideas of morality and where they come from. He says, wherever there is an ascendant class, a large portion of the morality of the country emanates from its class interests and its feelings of class superiority. This may sound very Marxist to you, and to some extent it is, but it, also, it is also the reality that the dominant class Whoever dominates society economically also manages to dominate it in terms of its ideology, in terms of its understanding, in terms of its um, narrative. The morality between Spartans and Helots, so Spartans were the rulers and Helots were the slaves of the Spartans. Between planters and Negroes, in the south of the United States of America, of course, you had these massive planters who you would plant cotton and other things and 
under them worked slaves who were basically from Africa, between princes and subjects, between nobles and rotors, between men and women, has been for the most part, please note that he's including gender here as well, between men and women, has been for the most part the creation of these class interests and feelings. And the sentiment thus generated react in turn upon the moral feelings of the members of the ascendant class in the relation amongst themselves. So the dominant ideas become the ideas of the domination uh, of the class that dominates. Um, because I, if I am a planter and I have hundreds of Negroes or African Americans rather working under me, then I will also justify enslaving them that they should work. Or if I am a, you know, in the upper caste, then I will justify why there ought to be a caste system, why people below me ought to be below me, I will find some justification for it. Now that justification may be religious, I may say God has ordained things this way. It may be that uh, I may ascribe it to nature, it's just natural that some people are slaves and some people are masters. I may ascribe it to my abilities, I work harder, I'm smarter, I belong to, I'm more intelligent than they are, that is why they are beneath me, etc, etc. We may ascribe to it all sorts of reasons why we are in a privileged position in comparison to others, why we dominate over others. But the interesting thing is that not only does that idea influence the way we interact with those who are beneath us, taken out, not only do we form, you know, do we have many, many ideas that correspond to that. Misal ke pe, take the ordinary thing ke in our friendships, we generally tend to befriend people who belong to our own social class. Uh, uh, our best friends generally belong to the same class we belong to, correct? Am I wrong? Anybody that here that's an exception to that? that belongs to the upper middle class and has friends from the working, whose best friend is a working class guy who works in a factory or something? Anyone? Raise your hands. Not one person in this class, correct? Um, in fact, it'd be very, very exceptional if your friends are from a class that is different from you. Vice versa, people who are from the working class don't have friends from the upper classes. Very rarely. They may have acquaintances, but not friends. And quite similar to that, our marriages are always on the basis of class. For example, it is very rare that somebody who belongs to the bourgeoisie will get married to somebody who belongs to the working class. Uh, have you heard of anybody, that, any family where that, that, that has happened? Maybe one or two, but it is extremely, extremely rare. And it becomes all the more rare as the two classes separate themselves in terms of culture and ideas and so on. Now, as, the two, as classes separate themselves in terms of culture and ideas, the, 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 the ideas of domination also react upon how we relate to each other, John Stuart Mill says. So for example, here we are uh, in this lecture at LUMS, I am speaking to you in a language that 98% of the people of Pakistan will not be able to understand. The medium of instruction at this university is English. If I start speaking to you in Urdu, uh, some of you will go and complain to the head of department and say, Ke, sir, to Urdu mein padha rahe, ya Punjabi mein padha rahe, hum to Angrezi mein padhne aaye the. And this has happened, of course, because you, the, the, because you are preparing yourself to become, uh, to, to become employable in an economy that places a very big premium on your ability to speak the English language. Uh, and so what happens is that you will end up developing, as a consequence of that, a form of insular culture where you are able to relate to people who in turn relate to you uh, with <coughs> certain cultural idioms, etc. You might not be able to move out of that. So what happens is, he says, morality is built on these ideas of class and privilege and so on. And this creates, of course, of course human servility. The civility of mankind towards the supposed preferences or versions of their temporal and masters or of their gods has made men burn magicians and heretics. In history we have seen that because general society, they look up to the section of society that dominates. So workers look up to people who are rich. In, in any given society you look up to, to people who are better off than you, right? And a, a lot of times you want to emulate them that in any given society, whatever the rulers do becomes the benchmark for morality, for talent, 
for you know, virtue, for what is good, etc. Even when they do absurd and ridiculous things. What this creates, he says, is a situation of human civility. The likings and dislikings of society, or of some powerful portion of it, are thus the main thing which practically determines the rules laid down for general observance under the penalties of law or opinion. And the whole problem, says John Stuart Mill, is that so few now dare to be eccentric marks the chief danger of the time. Yannike, you really can't be yourself in a world in which you are bombarded by what, how you ought to be cool and what it means to be cool. And here we have another very big problem, which he calls the odium theologicum. He says he is a sincere bigot. Who is he talking about? Of course, he's talking about theologians, the priests, and so on. Those who first broke the yoke of what called itself the universal church were in general as little willing to permit difference of religious opinion as that church itself. It might surprise you to know that the Protestants, the Anglicans and others who broke from the Catholic Church in turn were just as strict about enforcing their religion as the Catholics were about enforcing their religion. And you can see this, by the way, in uh, various religious communities in Pakistan. Of course, you have the majority community, which is Sunni. And then you have uh, minority communities, etc., within Muslims and outside of uh, Islam as well. And if you notice, the minority community may be just as strict about enforcing its religion on its community as the majority community is strict about enforcing its religion on the minority. So um, <clears throat> what's going on here? Well, he says, they preferred endeavoring to alter the feelings of mankind on the particular points on which they uh, were themselves heretical. So they wanted humanity to accept their points of view rather than make common cause in the defense of freedom with heretics generally. But they were not in favor of your right to be a heretic. They were heretics from the religion they belonged to at first. But they did not want, in turn, others to be heretics from their religion. Mill says, in fact, that freedom of conscience is and ought to be an indefensible right. The great writers have asserted that freedom of conscience is an indefensible right. They have asserted it as an indefensible right and denied absolutely that a human being is accountable to others for his religious beliefs. This is a very radical idea. Because this is not an idea that we in Pakistan accept, despite the fact that we may even accept that an artist has the right to display their exhibition. We do not necessarily accept the idea, the majority, do not accept the idea that a human being is not accountable to another human being for their religious beliefs. Of course, we can find elements of this in a religion. For example, the Quran also says that there is no coercion in religion. If there is no coercion in religion, then you are not accountable to other people for your religious beliefs. But, the, but that's not the way we practice uh, religion, is it? The way we practice religion is that we do feel that it is our duty to, in fact, enforce onto others and onto society the things that we hold to be correct and dear. This is also quite natural. I mean, I'm not saying this is uh, unnatural. If you think something is absolutely right, if you think, you know, this is going to really be good for you. Aapka kya naam? Sorry? Naima. Naima, if I think this is really going to be good for you, you're going to go to, you're going to, go to heaven. And you're going to, you know, have all of God's great gifts. Then if, of course, it's going, if I truly, utterly believe that something really is good for Naima, and I truly, utterly want good things to come to Naima, then I might force Naima to do the things that will bring her good things. Because I truly believe them to be good. So you can understand from the point of view of the true believer why he cannot or she cannot let go of uh, or, or accept the idea that others are not accountable to them or to the community for their religious beliefs. But this is the essential contradiction. This is the conflict. When can a society then interfere with the liberty of the individual? 
اکثر لوگ یہ سمجھتے ہیں when they argue on social media for example کہ on the part of liberals that liberals are arguing that there ought to be no limit placed on anybody اور اگر کوئی بندہ مثال کے طور پر ایک بڑی عام سی چیز ہوتی ہے کہ آپ کسی کو گالی لکھتے ہیں کسی نے کوئی opinion express کیا ہے اس نے کہا جبران ناصر بڑا بیبا بندہ ہے ٹھیک ہے اس کے اوپر سے گالی آئے گی موٹی سی تڑال کر کے بہت بڑی کو گالی ہوگی ٹھیک ہے نا جب وہ گالی آئے گی تو جو اس بندے کو گالی پڑی ہوگی وہ دوسرے بندے کو بلاک کر دے گا کرے گا نا جب یا گالی نہیں بھی ہوگی تو کوئی انسلٹ ہوگی ٹویٹر پر روز اس طرح کی چیز ہوتی ہے جب آپ اس کو انسلٹ کریں گے وہ آپ کو بلاک کرے گا جب آپ کو بلاک کریں گے وہ پھر ایک ٹویٹ لکھے گا وہ کہے گا دیکھو لیبرلز ایکسپوزڈ کتنے برے لیبرل تھے کہ they did not allow for the freedom of speech میں نے ان کو گالی بکی ان کو میری گالی سننی چاہیے تھی یا میں نے ان کو انسلٹ کیا ان کو میری انسلٹ سننی چاہیے تھی یہ آگیومنٹ ہمیں اکثر ملتی ہے but what does جان سٹوٹ مل سے is there a limit or is it unlimited جو مرضی جو جس کے موں میں آئے دل میں آئے بکتا چلا جائے لیبرلز کیا اس بات کو قبول کرتے ہیں نہیں Mill says the sole end for which mankind are warranted individually or collectively in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their members is self-protection. The only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. If there is any situation in which harm to others can come about, then society does have the right to limit that speech. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. In other words, I cannot interfere in Naima's life if the actions that she is performing only impact her own life. Even if those actions impact her own life or your own life negatively, I can advise you, I can talk to you, but I cannot compel or force you to not harm yourself. As long as you are only harming yourself. So I cannot, I ought not to be from a liberal point of view, be able to compel you to do good. Not to, I can convince you, not compel. But I can, however, compel you to stop any speech or action that brings about harm to someone other than yourself. If your action results in that person being harmed, then society does have a right to tell you to not say the things that you, not say, hold the opinion, or not voice the opinions that you may hold. So for example, if your opinion is that Ahmadis ought to be killed, Jews ought to be killed, minorities ought not to exist, anybody who eats meat ought to be uh, lynched by a mob, if those are your views, then John Stuart Mill says, those views are such that they take the life of another person. And those views, liberals say, society does have a right to compel to uh, stop. <clears throat> so what is individual sovereignty? The only part of the conduct of anyone for which he is amenable to society is that which concerns others. Anything that concerns others, you have to be amenable to society. In the part which merely concerns himself or herself, his or her independence is of right absolute. My independence over myself is absolute as long as it does not harm anyone else. Over himself, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. And you can see quite clearly that from this premise, this liberal premise created by John Stuart Mill, you also get the feminist slogan, Mera Jism Meri Marzi, uh, which perhaps ought to have been Mera Jism Mera Haq, my right rather than my will, but anyway, that's a separate debate. But the point is that it's really the application of Mill's harm principle to gender politics from which you get the slogan, Mira, just a Mary Mercy. The doctrine does not, of course, apply to children. Bachon ke liye cheez nahi hai, because bachche jo hai, wo cognitively underdeveloped hai. Or aap bhi mainly bachche hai, isliye aap bhi apply nahi hoti. Badaak kar raha. But, 
After the age of 18, it basically, before the age of 18, it does not apply because you are not at that point in time, society has judged cognitively <coughs> developed enough to take those decisions in a, in a way which is, um, uh, which is uh, you know, uh, you, you are not fully aware of, uh, you don't have the information or the cognitive ability to take those decisions. But here, next up, we find something very problematic and troubling in John Stuart Mill. Together with children, he says that this doctrine does not apply to backward states or to backward races. Here, he says, despotism is a legitimate mode of government in dealing with barbarians. Charlemagne or Akbar are necessary. Now, you might I don't, I don't know. I find this, I, I, I think you might find this disturbing. I find it deeply disturbing. Because John Stuart Mill and his daddy dear were both uh, uh, stockholders of the East India Company, which of course was exploiting uh, South Asia, India, uh, deeply exploitative, and, they, and people who were stockholders were making lots and lots of money from the exploitation of people of India. Where during the Bengal famine, they caused the death of millions of people while they were extracting uh, agricultural surplus during the famine. And therefore, for Mill to not apply this principle that he applies to Europeans, for him not to apply it to, uh, to people of other races, to people who are African Americans, let's say, to Africans, to Indians, to Asians, is deeply prejudicial, racist, and uh, biased. And I would not be amiss to point out to you, in fact, that though I am often called a liberal on social media, I am not, in fact, a liberal. Um, in fact, this kind of mentality where European liberals frequently excluded from the, uh, both Africans as well as Asians uh, from the rights that they were ready to extend to Europeans is conspicuous by its presence. It's, every, it's in a lot of places. It's everywhere, in fact. That when it came to talking about the rights of the slaves in the United States of America, nearly all the liberals would, were silent on that or even supported, you'll be shocked to discover, slavery. Or were blind to it completely. Or when it came time to oppose colonialism, most of the liberals were completely blind to the fact that colonialism was deeply exploitative of third world countries. Rather, they thought that they were doing us a favor by ruling over us. They thought that they were bringing civilization to uh, India and South Asia. And you can see that also, of course, in Mill. Mill was a utilitarian, um, but he was a utilitarian with a different uh, idea. You can say that his concept of utility was based on the interests of mankind as a progressive being. So he says, I regard utility as the ultimate appeal on all ethical questions. Happiness is good. But it must be utility in the largest sense, grounded on the permanent interests of man as a progressive being. Utility based on the idea that man must progress further and further. So that's why he says it is better to be a Socrates unsatisfied than to be a satisfied pig. It is better to be unsatisfied in the search of something grander, greater, that will create the progress of mankind than to be satisfied with just eating chocolates or something. On liberty, he says, the inward domain of consciousness, demanding liberty of consciousness in the most comprehensive sense, liberty of thought and feeling, absolute freedom of opinion and sentiment on all subjects, practical or speculative, scientific, moral or theological. This is what liberty is. This includes the liberty of expressing and publishing opinion. Yani, whether it's science, whether it's art, whether it's philosophy, whether it's religion, all of these things, as long as you are not hurting and harming other people, calling for their blood or something, in sub chizmope there should be complete liberty to not only think in a different way, but to express your opinion in a different way. Liberty of tastes and pursuits, 
of framing the plan of your life to suit your own character. This reminds me of the three idiots, which is all, which is classic John Stuart Mill, where you have these three idiots who decide, who become, who are becoming engineers, but who decide to pursue engineering in the way that they want to pursue engineering, rather in the way that society wants to, wants them to pursue it. Of doing as we like, subject to such consequences as may follow, without impediment from our fellow creatures, as long as what we do does not harm them, even though they should think our conduct foolish, perverse, or wrong. You may think that my conduct of throwing up my shoe is foolish, perverse, or wrong. But you have to grant me the right to do such foolish things uh, if they make a good point, as long as they don't harm other people. We must also allow people the freedom to unite for any purpose, not involving. Aap has rahe hain. Maine bada serious point mara. Illustrate karke aapko dikhaya hai point. Theek hai na? Freedom. And please note that aapki aap aapka aapka kya tasur hota hai? Uske mere is act pe rather foolish act pe. You might consider it rather foolish. I continued speaking as if nothing had happened. That's the kind of person that John Stuart Mill wants you to be, unaffected by the tyranny of the majority. You may think I'm making a fool of myself, but as long as I'm not harming you, I will do whatever it is that I please. And I really don't care about your opinion in this regard. Mill would say that would be a good thing if it, you shouldn't. Because if you care too much about the opinion of other people, then you end up conforming to the tyranny of the majority. You don't end up exploring the person that you really want to be. Now this is a theme that we see constantly repeated in movie after movie in Hollywood, in film after film after film after film. Be your own self. Don't care what the world says. This. He says, in fact, what we need to have is liberty of tastes and pursuits, framing the, our life plan the way we want to frame them, of doing as we like, subject to such consequences as may follow, without impediment from our fellow creatures, so long as what we do does not harm them, even though they should think our conduct foolish and perverse. We must have the freedom to unite for any purpose, not involving harm to others. Um, the persons combining must be, of course, of full age and must not be forced or deceived, but they must have these rights. No society in which these liberties are not on the whole respected is free, whatever may be its form of government. So you see here the difference between a democracy and a liberal democracy. A democracy is one, of course, in which the state is constrained by the elected represent uh, is, is, is created, is run by the elected representatives of the people. There are checks and balances of power, and so on and so forth. But a society in which there may be an election is not necessarily also a liberal society. A liberal society is one which safeguards the right of the individual. That is very, very important. It doesn't just safeguard you from excesses of the state, but also safeguards you from excesses of society itself. So, what about the regulation of private conduct? Mill says, ancient philosophers and states thought themselves entitled to practice the regulation of every part of private conduct by public authority. For example, Plato says, okay, you know, I will censor these poems, ye poems suno, you know, the poets will be censored, etc. Some plays will be censored. We will only uh, pay attention to those things that make you noble. And uh, Plato thinks that the guardians have the right to tell you and to force you to, to, to develop in, the, in a direction that makes you uh, more knowledgeable, uh, that makes you, you know, more aware, all of these things, and make society develop, etc., etc., a knowledge-based society. But the liberals have a very different point of view. Their point of view is that the state does not have the right to guide you in this way. And he includes, of course, all ancient philosophers, in which will also be included philosophers who we consider to be uh, religious philosophers, prophets in other words. He's saying all of them thought that th there was no public-private distinction here. Your private life was as much subject to uh, interference by outside, by society or by, by the powers that be as was 
your private life, there's no public private distinction. But Mill wants to introduce that. The liberals want to say there are some things that are your domain as an individual, and there are some things that are in the domain of politics. This may have been admissible in small republics surrounded by powerful enemies. My mantong ki jahan choti choti state stage inke khilaf bade bahut bade dushman the to thik tha in constant peril of being subverted by foreign attacks or internal commotion and to which even a short interval of relaxed energy and self command might so easily be fatal that they could not afford to wait for the salutary uh, permanent effects of freedom so yeah i accept that in some situations freedom has to be crushed in order for survival these were very small states that were threatened or something. But in modern states, this is no longer acceptable. There must be liberty of press in modern states. If all mankind, minus one, imagine there are seven billion people on the planet. Imagine if seven billion of them have one opinion that the earth is round, and one person has another opinion, and that opinion is probably wrong, that the earth is flat. If all mankind, minus one, were of one opinion, and only one person were of the contrary opinion, mankind would be no more justified in silencing that one person than he, if he had the power, would be justified in silencing mankind. If one person keeps a different opinion, then he has the right to say that he can go to his own point, go to the press, write, tell, and keep it in front of you. Why? Because silencing of discussion is an assumption of infallibility. اگر آپ یہ کہتے ہیں کہ دوسرے کا نکتہ نظر میں نے سننا ہی نہیں ہے اس نکتہ نظر کو سماج میں پریزنٹ ہونے کی اجازت ہی نہیں ہے اس کا مطلب ہے کہ آپ اس چیز پر کنونسٹ ہیں کہ جو آپ کا نکتہ نظر ہے وہ انفیلیبل ہے وہ کبھی بھی اس کو غلط نہیں ثابت کیا جا سکتا سائلنسنگ دی ایکسپریشن آف ان اپینین اس رابنگ دی ہیومن ریس یو آر ٹیکنگ اوے فرم آل آف ہیومنیٹی اف دی اپینین اس رائٹ دی آر ڈیپرائیوڈ آف دی اپرچنیٹی آف اگر وہ صحیح کہہ رہا تھا تو ساری مینکائنڈ سے آپ نے کیا راب کر لیا the opportunity to fix its mistake if wrong they lose what is almost as great a benefit what is that the clearer perception and livelier impression of truth produced by its collision with error in other words اگر اس کا opinion غلط بھی ہے اور دو opinions collide کرتے ہیں اس کے نتیجے میں جو سچ ہے وہ اور بھی زیادہ نکھر کر سامنے آئے گا اور یہ بھی بینیفیشل ہے مینکائنڈ کے لیے سو اس لیے غلط اپنین بھی ہو ایکسٹریم مائنورٹی میں بھی ہو اس کو بھی حق دیں کہ وہ اپنا اپنین ایکسپریس کرے and please remember that every age has held many opinions which subsequent ages have deemed not only false but absurd بہت ہم نے دیکھے ایسے اپنینز جو کسی ایک دور کے اندر لوگ سرستے تھے بلکل درست ہیں اور بعد میں وہ غلط ثابت ہوئے مثال کے طور پر the opinion that the earth is flat was once upon a time a dominant opinion and it turned out to be an absurd idea totally incorrect similarly there was the idea that slavery was natural justified even justified in religion justified by God justified by nature and today if somebody wants to enslave someone else Mankind will say, are you out of your mind? That, you know, we should accept slavery. Nobody will accept it. There was a time when it was taken as a given that women were cognitively inferior than men. Nobody really debated and discussed it too much. Some did, you know, others, mainly it wasn't really a big question. But today, anybody who says that largely will be considered, will be shut out certainly of the burger and even of the bun kebab crowd. Right? At least you have to pretend to be vogue. Vogue, as my friend pointed out. Men and government <clears throat> must act to the best of their ability, there's no doubt. You must act on the given knowledge. There is no such thing as absolute certainty. You cannot be 100% certain of anything, he's saying. We make and must, ma must assume our opinions to be true for guidance of our own conduct. We, 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 we think, you know, we have to act on the information that we currently have. But we should never think that that information is always is infallible. There may be some chance that that information is later proved to be incorrect. So we must always be open to the other side of the argument. If you are right, you will be proved right in the discussion. If you are wrong, you will correct your opinion and that will be a good thing. Bhajan, what are you doing? 
Is there either tawajjud hai, please? Thank you. But there is a great difference between presuming an opinion to be true because with every opportunity for contesting it, it has not been refuted. First, there is an opinion that is true every time. You have implemented it and it is proven to be to help you correctly. You have said that Earth is flat and you are going and you are flat. So, you will understand that it is okay. So, you can assume, you can act on an opinion assuming that it is true. But, uh, but if you assume, but you must not assume it's truth for the purpose of not permitting its refutation. But you must not say, okay, even if every opportunity has confirmed that opinion, you still should allow the opposite opinion to contest against that opinion, which even every experience has proven to be true. So you must not close that option out, he says. Because criticism is necessary for growth. We grow and develop by keeping our mind open to criticism, to new ideas. The steady habit of correcting and completing his own opinion by collating it with those of others, so far from causing doubt and hesitation in carrying it into practice, is the only stable foundation for just reliance on it. In other words, the habit of correcting your opinion through debate and discussion it, that is the only way that you can progress as a society. We must listen patiently to the devil's advocate. The, dev, the point of view which we totally agree with, disagree with, we must have the ability to listen, to, uh, uh, to, to, to discuss, to debate. Um, people understand their own business and their own interests better and care for them more than the government does or can be expected to do. And this is one of the key things why individuality is so important to, to liberals and to John Stuart Mill. Government does not understand you as well as you understand yourself. Hence, there should be a domain that should be only up to you to decide how you want to act in that domain. But is this applicable to the extreme case? Even to the case where somebody says the earth is flat? He says, yes. Strange it is that men should admit the validity of the arguments for free discussion but object to their being pushed to an extreme, not saying that unless the reasons are good for an extreme case, they are not good for any case. So whatever the case may be, even in the case of an absurd argument, that absurd argument also should have the right to express itself. The modern age is destitute of faith, but also terrified of skepticism. Yani ke modernity ke andar, religion to piche chala gaya hai. Ek fact hai, Europe ke andar at least. Bagar, at the same time, people are terrified of what he calls skepticism, questioning, questioning everything. The claims of opinion to be protected from public attack are rested not so much on its truth as on its importance to society. People say, no, this opinion is very important to society. Well, they don't even say that it's correct. They say, if we challenge religion, if we challenge the state, if we challenge um, the two nation theory, if we challenge any of these things, that these opinions are so important to the construction of Pakistan that we should not allow them to be challenged in any way, shape or form. That's what that guy was saying at MD Parts, correct? Um, but here, they are also admitting something that is very important. They are admitting that they may not be true. They are only important, but not necessarily true. The usefulness of an opinion, however, he says, is a matter, is itself a matter of opinion, as disreputable as open to discussion and requiring discussion as much as the opinion itself. So this is also up for debate whether the opinion that you say is actually useful for society. You say it's useful for society. Is it actually useful for society? That itself is a debatable point, he's saying. Religion also cannot be excluded from such criticism. There was once a man named Socrates who was put to death by his countrymen. His accuser asserted that he believed in no gods at all, that he was a corrupter of youth. And yet today, we have, history has judged Socrates to have been a great man and his accusers who put him to death in the name of religion to have been bigots. Of these charges, the tribunal honestly found him guilty and condemned the man who probably, of all then born, had deserved the best of mankind. And yet he was put to death as a criminal. Yani ke society really ought to, Athenian society really ought to have been grateful that the, such a man was born in their midst who contributed so greatly to the development of thought that all subsequent people have, have considered him to be the father of philosophy. 
And yet, the, 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 the father, the first teacher of philosophy, was put to death. And let's not forget, he says, and I, I love this passage. This is a beautiful passage. He says, Jesus Christ himself was put to death as a blasphemer. More than 1800 years ago, the man who left on the memory of those who witnessed his life and conversation such an impression of his moral grandeur that 18 subsequent centuries have done homage to him as the Almighty in person was ignominiously put to death as what? A blasphemer. Men did not merely mistake their benefactor. They mistook him for the exact contrary of what he was and treated him as a prodigy of impiety which they themselves are now held to be for their treatment of him. This great man who created such an impression on the people who followed him that they considered him, his conversation, his conduct to be not only worthy of emulation but to be the truth itself you know which they deified in the way that they you know refer to Jesus as the son of God was put to death in his own period of history such are the mistakes that people make and most of those who now who are now sure that he that his high priest Joseph Cephas con conduct if they had lived in his time and had been born Jews would have acted precisely as he did that oh I would not have done what those people did would probably have done the same if they were in those circumstances. After all, one of the persecutors of Jesus Christ was, no, was Saint Paul himself. Saint Paul, of course, is the most influential figure in uh, Christianity after Jesus Christ. And yet, at the time of Christ, Saint Paul, at that time a Jew who called himself Saul, was in favor of Jesus being put to death. And later he said, it, uh, and he regretted it and then he dedicated his life to spreading Christianity. What about Marcus Aurelius, he says. Marcus Aurelius persecuted Christianity. He failed to see that Christianity was to be a good and not an evil to the world. And yet, Marcus Aurelius is no villain. He's not a bad guy. He's a good guy. The, he was, he says, the most gentlest and most amiable of philosophers and rulers <coughs> under a solemn sense of duty. And yet he authorized the persecution of Christianity. To my mind, this is one of the most tragic facts in all history. It is a, it is a bitter thought how different it, uh, the uh, Christianity of the world might have been if the Christian faith had been adopted as the religion of the empire under the auspices of Marcus Aurelius instead of those uh, uh, instead of, of those of Constantine. If Marcus Aurelius had turned to Christianity, Christianity and the world would have been even better than it were uh, under Constantine. Because Constantine, he says, was not a philosopher, he was a politician, etc. But Marcus Aurelius was, a, was not only an emperor, he was a philosopher. And really a great philosopher. His book Meditations is read even today. And he was a very good, wise, just ruler. He expanded the Roman Empire. It became the largest empire uh, in his time. Um, and it, it reached its zenith really with Marcus Aurelius. This philosopher king who completed what Plato always wanted. He always wanted a philosopher king. Well, Marcus Aurelius was that philosopher king. And yet, this good man, this philosopher, this kind man, could not understand that Christianity was a good thing and persecuted Christians. Then we say, Kesar doesn't mind if the truth is persecuted because persecution cannot harm the truth. Good always wins. And how do you know that good always wins? Sir, because I have seen uh, Lord of the Rings and in Lord of the Rings good always wins. And I have seen other movies and every single movie I have seen the good guys always win. So we always believe that the good wins. But is this really true? That the authors of such splendid benefits should be requited by martyrdom. That their reward should be to be dealt with as the vilest of criminals. 
Is not upon this theory a deplorable error and misfortune for which humanity should mourn in sackcloth and ashes but the normal and justifiable state of things? This is what we rona chahiye ke this is what we did to people who who dedicated their lives for our betterment. We persecuted them, we killed them, we treated them as criminals. This is what we should be ashamed of this. And we think in a name Truth always triumphs over persecution. <coughs> but this, he says, and Gaur Karna Zara, is a pleasant falsehood. This is a joke. This is what you have to say in the past. The good guys always win. The good guys don't always win. Men repeat after uh, this is a pleasant falsehood which men repeat after one another until they pass into common places, but which all experience refutes. History teems with instances of truth put down by persecution. Please put down your telephones and pay attention to me. Thank you. History may itni sare examples hai. Great men who stood for and women who stood for great things were persecuted, crushed, defeated, destroyed. The Reformation, for example, broke out 20 times before Luther and it was crushed before it was finally successful. Spartacus rose up as a in a slave revolt. He, you know, led the slaves against the Roman emperors and yet Spartacus was defeated. And Jesus himself, you know, organized the Jews, etc. against uh, the Romans, etc. But his own, his, in his own lifetime, uh, you know, was persecuted and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, punished as a criminal, given the, you know, one of the worst punishments, uh, no, in fact, the worst punishment that the Romans used to give, which was crucifixion. No reasonable person can doubt that Christianity might have been extirpated in the Roman Empire. It spread and became predominant because the persecutions were only occasional, lasting but a short time, and separated by long intervals of almost undisturbed propagandism. If the Romans had wanted to, they would have killed every Christian. And that would have been the end of Christianity. But luckily, they did persecute Christians. But the persecutions, you know, were few and far in between. They were horrible and terrible. But in between the persecutions, Christians had long periods of time in which they could organize. And that's what saved Christianity, is the tolerance of the Romans. Men are not more zealous for truth than they often are for error. And a sufficient application of legal or even of social penalties will generally succeed in stopping the propagation of either. Yet such nahi hai that people always want the truth, that people strive for the truth. Thoda sa pressure is taraf dalo ya us taraf dalo, to hum sabhi khadim rizli ban jayenge. Koi fikr ki baat nahi. It's a very sobering idea. It's a sobering thought. And I want you to think about it carefully, which is why I asked you to put down your phones and pay attention. The good guys don't always win. If you persecute all the time, you, and in history we have seen the persecution of so many good guys, you are robbing and taking away from humanity its opportunity to improve itself, to progress. Can truth survive? I conclude with this strife. slide. Sorry. The real advantage which truth is consists in this. That when an opinion is true, it may be extinguished once, twice, or many times. But in the course of ages, there will generally be found persons to rediscover it. Until someone of its early appearances falls on a time when, the form favor when from favorable circumstances, it escapes persecution until it has made such head as to withstand all subsequent attempts to suppress it. The only advantage that truth has is that sometime or the other it may be rediscovered in a period where society will be open enough to allow it to spread. That's why we must create a society that allows for a certain amount of difference of opinion to exist and to express itself openly and freely because that is what moves society forward even when that opinion is about ideas that we hold to be very, very dear and true, such as religion, such as the strength and importance of the state, uh, such as uh, what is right or wrong, we must allow that debate and discussion to occur, even if there's only one person standing on the other side, we must not be afraid of it. If we are true, 
if our opinions are correct, um, if our opinions are incorrect, firstly, we will, of course, Im we will, of course, embrace the truth and let go of the opinions that were incorrect and move forward as a society. And if our opinion is correct and the differing opinion is incorrect, we still have nothing to fear. It will not cause chaos or confusion. All it will do is it will allow the correct opinion to represent itself in an even more livelier, you know, stronger manner. It will manifest itself as the truth more strongly. It will, jisko kehte hain, nikhar ke saamne aayega. So we have nothing to fear from such debate, discussion, and so on. Maybe those who are in power on the basis of certain narratives may fear those narratives being contested because they fear their power and privilege being contested. This, of course, only shows their own insecurity. Maybe somewhere deep down inside they know that in contestation with a, with a rival point of view, their point of view will not survive that confrontation, which is why they attempt to stop it. But what they do by undertaking such an action is that they are robbing humanity of the opportunity to grow, develop, and progress. However, there are limits to this as well. And the limit is that the opinion expressed must not be such, or the action undertaken, or the association formed must not be such that it in and of itself harms the lives, liberty, and property of other people. So hate speech can be, in fact, controlled. Slaws against certain kind of racist, sexist, or um, classist speech can, in fact, be created. S certain opinions can be, uh, uh, can be quashed if it can be shown that those opinions harm other people. There, the limits of freedom do apply. So liberalism is not the right to say anything and everything you want. Liberalism is the right to say anything and everything you want as long as it does not harm. To, uh, liberalism is the right to lead your life as you wish. Do whatever you want in your life. But the condition is you cannot lead your life in such a way that it harms other people. If you lead your life in a way, if you take actions or make speech that harm other people, then society does have a right to intervene and say, no, I'm sorry, you can't do that. Thank you all. That is John Stuart Mill.